Well, good morning. I want to welcome you to Harmony Baptist Church on this cold, wintry weekend. It's uh, sure great to have you with us. Uh, we look forward today to studying about facing the giants in our lives, and then we're going to end our service with a time of communion. Uh, but first, let's begin with a little bit of singing. We look forward to that, and we invite you to join us as we sing.
before we open God's word together, would you join me in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to worship together. We thank you for your word, which sustains us. And we thank you for the uh, sense that we have that in spite of all the challenges of this world, in spite of, of all the things that, that scare us, that uh, intimidate us, that have us anxious, uh, you are in control and you are on our side. We thank you for that. We look to you now for a message from your word that will give us what we need for the week ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, one of my favorite Bible stories and probably one of the, the favorites uh, for a lot of young men growing up, uh, there's probably very few that don't know this story. I'm talking about the story of David and Goliath. And I think it's an important story for us to look at today because uh, many Christians never achieve the maximum potential of their lives because they uh, never conquer the one thing that they fear the most. We must learn how to defeat the Goliaths that seem to tower over us. And David's example shows us how. If you will, uh, will you open your Bible with me to first chap? First Samuel, and uh, looking at chapter 17, and we're going to uh, uh, take a look at that chapter today. We don't have time to read the entire chapter, but keep your Bibles open to it, uh, because I want to begin uh, there right now. First Samuel, chapter 17, and I'm beginning uh, at verse 1. The Philistines now mustered their army for battle and camped uh, between Soko in Judah and Azekah, uh, at Ephes Damon, Saul countered by gathering his Israelite troops near the valley of Elah. So the Philistines and Israelites faced each other on opposite hills with the valley between them. In the late 19th century, uh, Claude uh, Condor and Herbert Kitchener described the Elah Valley as being one of the most fertile districts in Palestine. It's an open, flat veil about a half a mile across, they said, and covered with corn. A narrow trench runs down the center, full of white pebbles, worn by the water that runs there in the winter. Here and there, large terran birds grow along its course, and solitary oak trees. On either side rise the stony hills, covered with brushwood and wild growth. Get that setting in your mind, and I have a picture of it here, uh, and, and, and keep that in mind as we continue to read. Let's look at verse, chap verse 4. Then Goliath, a Philistine champion from Gath, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was over nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet and his bronze coat of mail that weighed 125 pounds. He also wore bronze leg armor and he carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. The shaft of his spear was as heavy and thick as a weaver's beam, tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. His armor bearer walked ahead of him, carrying a shield. Now this uh, champion named Goliath, from Gath, comes out of the Philistine camp. He's, he's over nine feet tall, and he's wearing this heavy armor, and he has a spear uh, that is, is 15 pounds just on the head. This text helps us to understand why the name Goliath has become not just a name, but an adjective used to describe anything gigantic in life. Can you imagine uh, what an imposing creature this guy would have been. I mean, the Raptors would love to have him on their team. But it wasn't just his size that made him so formidable. He was outfitted with the best armor of the day to deflect arrows and sword thrusts, a, a canvas-like uh, coat that, that was covered with, with uh, like a chain mail made from bronze. He had a bronze helmet and he had this javelin or spear uh, that hung between his shoulders that had an iron spearhead. This was rare and expensive weaponry in those days. Can you imagine someone strong enough to throw a spear with a 15-pound 
head on it. Plus, Goliath stood behind a shield bearer, a man whose only job was to shield Goliath from any arrows or, or spears being thrown at him. Most Hebrew soldiers didn't have any weaponry like this, so with his size and with his armor and with the weaponry he had, it was clear that the odds were stacked against anyone foolish enough to face Goliath in battle. Let's look at verse 8 and 9 and notice what Goliath does. Goliath stood and shouted a taunt across to the Israelites. Why are you all coming out to fight, he called. I am the Philistine champion, but you are only the servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. You know, what Goliath suggested here was a, a tactic commonly used in the Eastern world. It was called representative battle. It was a one-on-one -on -one fight. Here was the deal. Goliath would represent the Philistines and the Israelites would choose their own champion. And, and, and whoever won that fight, well, that army won. And whoever lost that fight, their army lost. This tactic saved time and it saved lives. I, I guess it was kind of like a, an overtime shootout in hockey. Uh, you know, I, I will send my Connor McDavid against your Austin Matthews and whoever actually scores, well, that team wins. But please note that Goliath didn't issue this challenge one time and then leave. No, his challenge went on for 40 days. Every morning and every evening, for over a month, he marched out and stood there, flaunting his, his size and his strength and all his fighting gear and daring someone to take him on. Now, you and I likely don't face literal giants in our lives. There probably isn't nine feet tall people challenging us to a fight every day, but we do face frightening things in our lives, Goliath-sized problems. And like David's Goliath, ours don't just come at us one time. I don't know if any of you can relate, but it seems that these Goliaths of life come on a regular basis, a morning and evening, day after day, relentlessly trying to intimidate us. We wake up and the, and the first thing on our minds is that Goliath that waits for us in our day. It might be the Goliath of unpaid bills. It might be the Goliath of a disease that we are fighting. It might be a Goliath at work. It, it, I don't know what your Goliath might be, but if you can relate at all to this, then you know that these Goliaths never stop taunting us across the ravines of our soul. Well, meanwhile, about 10 or 15 miles away up in the Judean mountains in the town of Bethlehem, David was on the job taking care of his father's sheep. And unlike three of his older brothers, he was too young to fight, to be in the army. But as the weeks dragged on, Jesse became worried about his older sons, and so he sent David to take them some food and to check on them. Look at verses 17 through 19. One day Jesse said to David, take this basket of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread and carry them quickly to your brothers and give these ten cuts of meat to their captain. Uh, cuts of cheese to their captain. See how your brothers are getting along and bring back a report of how they're doing. David's brothers were with Saul and the Israelite army at the Valley of Elah, fighting against the Philistines. So early the next morning, David obeys his father. Verse 20 says that he, as he came up over the rise, he caught sight of both armies spread out on the plain before him. It must have been a sight that was both exciting and frightening. You know, for a teenage guy who had spent all his time up in the hills with the sheep, this must have been quite a scene of, of chaos. But as David got near the edge of the Israelite camp, he sees the troops lining up in battle formation, he hears the war cries, and he stands there to watch. I'm sure any teenage boy would. Look at verses 22 to 24. 
David left his things with the keeper of supplies and hurried out to the ranks to greet his brothers. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, came out from the Philistine ranks. Then David heard him shout his usual taunt to the army of Israel. As soon as the Israelite army saw him, they began to run away. David leaves his things. He goes out there and he listens uh, to Goliath taunt everyone. Can you picture that scene? He's just standing there talking with his brothers, catching up, hearing the gossip. And, and then he hears this loud cry from across the ravine. And here's this gigantic man uh, marching across the stream bed and approaching the army, totally unafraid. All of a sudden, all the Israelite army, the whole, all the soldiers around him melt away leaving him standing there alone. Well, you know what happens next. Verses 40 to 50 describe the conflict. Let's read them together. He picked up five smooth stones from a stream and he put them in his shepherd's bag. Then armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. Goliath walked out toward David with his shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. Am I a dog? He, he roared at David that you come at me with a stick. And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here and I'll give you your flesh to the birds and wild animals, Goliath yelled. David replied to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defiled. Today the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you and cut off your head. And then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals, and the whole world will know that there's a God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. As Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him, reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone. He hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in, and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. Then he ran over and pulled Goliath's sword from his sheath and used it to kill him and cut off his head. You know, David has these few stones and, and he's not intimidated by this soldier coming at him with all this armor and, and this advanced weaponry. David trusts the Lord. And so he goes into battle against Goliath and he is victorious. He defeats him because he has put his trust in the Lord. It's important for us to learn from young David's example here because we can't become all we can be for God if we live in fear of the Goliaths in our lives. You and I have to be able to see our Goliath, whatever it is, from the perspective of God's limitless power, just as David did. Think of it this way. To defeat the giants in our lives, we don't need self-confidence. We need God-confidence. And David had that kind of vision. He pictured God as being so big that he had nothing else to fear. That's what led him to ask the other Hebrew soldiers, including King Saul, who is this Philistine that we, he should defy the armies of the living God? And you and I need to be able to see like David because you and I are in the Lord's army. When things appear bad, when giant problems come and we get scared, we need to stop and remember, hey, wait a minute, I'm in the Lord's army. I've got God on my side. I'm his child, and he's way bigger than these things that I'm worried about. You know, the rest of the soldiers looked at Goliath and said, look how much bigger he is than us. David looked at Goliath and said, look how much smaller he is than my God. When the other soldier said, he's too big to fight, David said, he's too big a target to miss. You know, giants always seem to have a, a way of being bigger or seeming bigger than they really are. The bad that is coming our way usually looks like it's the end of us. It's so much bigger than uh, 
it really is. And that's why it's so important for us to have an accurate understanding of God's nature and his power. That's why it's so important to spend time in our Bibles understanding the, the true power of God and all that he can accomplish. A, a God that, that created everything, that controls everything, that, that is master over everything. We need to be convinced that the way we choose to live is a direct consequence of our perception of the size of God. When we wake up in the morning, what happens if we believe in a small God? Well, we live in a constant state of fear and anxiety because everything depends on my strength, on my size. We feel exposed and weak and vulnerable to the giants of life. If we believe in a small God, then we, when we have the opportunity to share our faith with others, we don't take that opportunity because we think that our success depends on us, that we have to have the words right. We have to know exactly what to say, that it all depends on our skill. We forget that God is the one who works in people's hearts. If we believe in a small God, then we won't be generous in our giving to our church or to other people who need help because we'll believe that our financial security depends on us, that it'll be up to us to take care of ourselves and to provide for our families, that it, it all depends on me. Perhaps if we believe in a small God, we will try to get credit for something we didn't do. Uh, to, to make a name for ourselves, to somehow inflate ourselves in the way others see us because we don't trust in a big God who sees in secret and will one day give reward. When we shrink God, we offer prayer without faith, work without passion, service without joy, and suffering without hope. It results in fear and retreat, and a loss of vision, and a failure to persevere. That's true in our individual lives, and that's true in the lives of our churches. The way we think about God makes a difference in the choices we make. Think of the difference it would make in our individual lives and in our church as a whole if we could see clearly enough to understand how big God really is and how interested God really is in our lives. Remember, we must never look at our present circumstances and conclude that what we see is all there is to reality. No matter what life looks like at the present, no matter how much it appears that evil is winning, that chaos is all around us, we don't have the last word. Almighty God does. And that word is a word of hope and peace and victory for those who love him and who are walking in his will. Deuteronomy chapter 20 verse 3 and 4 says, Do not be faint-hearted or afraid. Do not be terrified or give way to panic. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies and to give you victory. And he's already done that. God has already won the victory. Today, as we enter into a brief time of communion, we remember the sacrifice of Jesus. When God won the ultimate battle for our souls, defeating the giants of sin and death and proclaiming victory and security for all eternity, for us all. We remember together until he comes again as victor to reign forever as Lord and King. You know, in the New Testament, in the book of 1 Corinthians, we read these words. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and he gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces, and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink from this cup, you're announcing the Lord's death 
and his victory until he comes again. Let's return thanks for God's victory through Jesus. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to live on this earth as an example for us all and then to give his life as a sacrifice for us all. Thank you for the victory that you won over sin and death that we might have life and life to the full. Amen. Shall we eat together? shall we drink together. Thanks be to God.
now as we close our service today, may God bless you and keep you. May you be strengthened by the knowledge that he sees you and is with you. And may you face the Goliaths in your life with courage this week because God is with you. Go in peace. Change the world.